Greetings, everyone. I'm Eric C., founder and owner of Soto Oat Selections and House All Pens. Over the next hour, we'll taste through six wines from our portfolio. But first, a bit about the people, the places, and our focus. Soto Oat Selections portfolio, it's unique. It's focusing on select historic categories of aged oxidative wines. These include Madeira and Marsala, French VDN, such as Bagnols, Rivasalds, and Mori, and rarities such as the Catalan Garnacha de Porta and Carcavelos. We don't endeavor to cover all categories. We venture only into those in which we feel we have something to add, and to do so with producers with whom we share a common vision. We appreciate their commitment to history, true to their, to their providence, and yielding wines of exemplary qualities. Their wines represent some of the the oldest known winemaking traditions. They're wines that are transformed by time, uh, by exposure to oxygen, sometimes even heat, culminating in a complex taste of age, that trait that is known as uh, rancio. This is where you're rewarded for a winemaker's patience, indeed uh, generations of patience. These people. People you see here, there are many more, uh, they continue to make their wines against the currents of the time. Uh, and we see what we see in them is that they're rooted in tradition, pragmatic, and sometimes stubborn. They're not unaware of what it takes uh, today uh, to sustain and grow these categories. To us, the role models of tenacity. While some of their historic wines may have hovered near extinction, their relevance to us and to the new generation of consumers is on the ascent. We're excited to share their wines with you. So who are we? We are Sotalone Selections, a team of 17 people that are spread out across the uh, United States. We distribute nationwide, and we have our own distribution team in the state of New York. While our involvement with these wines may be new to some of you, our efforts began back in 2012 with first round CO Sec and Madeira, and today includes over 20 producers with wine and vintages that in some cases date back over a century. So, people, place, and tradition. In other words, provenance. Place matters and history informs us. What we must remember is that these styles of wines uh, were, were dominant for centuries until just a few decades ago. And while today the dry reductive wines may rule the market, the aged oxidative wines are more than just novelties and, and artifacts. Quite to the contrary, their relevance to our consumer is still great, and it's growing. Look here. We see four pathways uh, uh, to growth with these types of wines. Uh, number one is what we've seen on premise. Uh, aged oxidative wines, whether dry or sweet, have had a stable and growing presence on wine list. Uh, to the left, you see spooning stable uh, here in Minneapolis. Here, the selling points were the versatility and uh, their utility at the table with sometimes difficult pairings, their range of expressions, and their durability, sometimes even their uh, flavor profiles that might share a commonality with the ascendant spirits of the bar, like bourbon, scotch, or rum. On the right, you see uh, Jack Rose Dining Saloon. Look at that, three walls of whiskey. You know, that's where you'll find your wine drinker on another night having a cocktail with a balance in sweetness, with bitter, uh, bitterness and acidity, or drinking a whiskey, where there's that great taste of uh, age and wood. Unsurprisingly, Jack Rose, they sell a lot of aged age oxidative wines. Third, you know, we're at home a lot now, more than we ever imagined, and we're cooking. Some of the best wine pairings uh, can be with aged oxidative wines. Ron Siosek, with Iowa pork chops, incredible. Bagnols with blue cheese, it's classic. And Madeira with uh, smoked fish or, well, just about anything. And a truly great Marsala not only pairs well with tiramisu, uh, it's a part of the recipe. And finally, number four, durability of these wines. Uh, nearly all of them, uh, once open, will last longer than your standard table wine. In fact, some of these, such as Madeira and Rancio Sec, are fully oxidized to the degree of which they're nearly indestructible and can keep for years. I'm going to add one more uh, 
benefit to these wines. Uh, they're approachable and accessible. I mean, think of this. The bonules uh, that you're going to taste later, it's aged over eight years, yet you'll find it on the shelf for $25, $30. When I say accessible, we, for what we carry, we have everything here stateside. So if you have a birthday for 1970 or 1950, and you need the wine next week, likely we can get it to you. So, two words will come up a lot today are Sotolone and Rancio. Sotolone, it's a part of our name, uh, and it's quite literally a flavor compound, one of the key components of flavors associated with Rancio. So what is Rancio? Look here. The word Rancio itself suggests something that has turned, sometimes bad, but in the context of wine and spirits, it is noble. It's a term of honor. It speaks to the taste and aromas that, that come with age. Look at this list. We love these things. So see what stands out to you as we taste through our wines. It's wines. Here's today's lineup. For what you like today and want to explore, let us know, as we have plenty more to share with you. At this point, I'll turn things over to our lead educator for the Soda Loan Portfolio, Jay Hennahan. Thank you, Eric. So the Fontenot Rancio Sec is one of three wines from the Roussillon region we'll be featuring today. And it's a key to understanding not only the Bagnols and Rivasol that come from them, that also come from the region, but nearly all of the wines in the Sotolone Selections portfolio. So if you haven't already begun to taste, let's get started. As you can see, Roussillon is last stop along the French Mediterranean before you cross the border into Spain. And while today it's incorporated into the greater languedoc roussillon region, it's always had its own distinct identity, geographically and culturally, and in terms of the wines that they've historically produced. This is the warmest and driest of all French wine regions, ideal for grape growing and organic viticulture. And the vineyards are thought to have first been planted around 600 BC by the Phoenicians, who were then followed by the Greeks and Romans. For centuries, this was part of the kingdom of Majorca, its and its people regard themselves as Catalan, sharing a language as well as culinary and wine traditions with their kin south of the border. Today, Roussillon is simultaneously one of France's most traditional and dynamic winemaking regions, producing underrated table wines, especially Couleur, France's best fortified wines, and of course, Rancio Sec. In many ways, Rancio Sec is the most traditional and the most radical punk rock wine there is. The wine closest to those prized by the Roman, ancient Greeks and Romans, and perhaps the original natural wine. When you think about how the wines might, must have been made in warm climates prior to the advent of fortification and electricity, there was, in essence, just three wines that could be made. The first would have been some version of Nouveau, make it, drink it, before it turns to vinegar or matterizes. The second would have been the forebearers of today's aromatized wines in Amari, preserved to some degree by the addition of local fruit, herbs, and spices. And finally, there were the aged wines that were the most celebrated in the annals of writers like Columella and Pliny the Elder more than two millennia ago. The latter wines would have had to have been made with very ripe grapes. Grapes whose natural sugar levels would have protected the wine against acetification and premature oxidation as it fermented slowly on and off with the seasons until the increased alcohol levels then secured the wine. And this is how it was until fortification was introduced. But the, the advent of fortification occurs piecemeal in the Mediterranean, with Sherry thought to be the first to add brandy back in the early 1600s. They were followed by Port in the 1730s, by Madeira in the 1750s, and finally by Marsala in the early 1800s. In short, everywhere the British wine traders established a significant commercial presence. But they never did in Catalonia or Roussillon, and fortification didn't begin to take hold there until the early 20th century. As a result, the best wines of the villages in Roussillon would have still been made much in the way the Romans did. So, when Bagnols, Rivasolt, and Maury became part of the inaugural class of French AOC wines back in 1936, 
fortification of those village wines became the rule. And overnight, the unfortified versions were nowhere. Basic vintatablos, wines that could no longer put the vill village name or the word rancio or even a date on the label. But Catalans are nothing if not stubborn and proud of their heritage. And the wines we know now as Rancio Sec and the Ranci continue to be made, albeit just for friends and family, commemorating births, weddings, anniversaries, and deaths. In 1989, Rancio Sec was recognized by Slow Food as an integral link to some of our most ancient wine traditions. And then finally, in 2012, more than 75, after more than 75 years, French EU uh, authorities allowed Rancio Sec to be bottled under the Code Catalan and Code Vermeil IGPs. And who happened just to be kicking around Roussillon circa 2012? That's right, Eric Seed. And I think I suspect Eric is telling you to take another sip of, the, of what's in your glass. As I mentioned, Rancio Sec is made from very ripe old vine passerelle grapes. Grenache Blanc, Grenache Gris, and Macabu most commonly for the whites, and Grenache Noir for the reds. The same grapes that are used to make the great Vindeau Naturels or fortified wines of the region. And while I'm not here to make the case for Rancio Sec as a natural wine, it does check many of those boxes. Native yeast, maceration of white grapes as well as red, with nothing added and nothing taken away. And regardless of what the, whether the producers practice organic or biodynamic viticulture, it is as non-interventionist as they come. You basically make the wine and forget about it for a decade or so. Elevage must last a minimum of five years and is heterogeneous, which is to say indoors or outdoors, exposed to the elements, in glass or in barrels of various sizes, with little or no temperature control, and infrequently, if ever, topped up. Concentrating through evaporation, sugar, and later the alcohol enable the wine in question to resist spoilage as they continue to oxidize until you have finally arrive what's in the glass. If Francio Sec is compared at all, it's most often to sherry, especially Amontillado, which is understandable. But there are significant differences, notably the absence of fortification, as well as the absence of floor, which is exceedingly rare in Roussillon. The relationship, if any, is that of the reemergence of this ancient is that the reemergence of this ancient wine is now inspiring producers elsewhere to study and return to their own earliest traditions, as is underway in the Sherry Triangle and Marsala. Sotolan Selections has the largest portfolio of Rancio Sec in the world. Even the Catalans think we're a bit strange, but these wines truly are the missing link in our long winemaking history and are integral to the cultures and the tastes that they've informed. But never mind that. Just taste what's in your glass. It's a wine avatar simultaneously capturing the past, the present, and perhaps the future of winemaking. So with no further preamble, let's talk about the wine itself. The Fontenelle Rancio Sec Lancet 2007, The Ancestor, is one of the benchmarks of our portfolio. Founded in 1989 by Pierre and Marie Claude Fontenelle, growers whose family holdings extend back into the mid 19th century, it's based in Tatabal, in the northern portion of Roussillon, a village which is both famous for its sheaths as well as the caves concerning prehistoric art and human remains, one of whom lends the, this wine its name. Pierre and Marie Claude began their semi retirement in 2017 and they passed the baton to Matthew and Elodie Collet, who are pictured in these, some of these photos. Lancet is made from serious old vines, the youngest from 1946 and the oldest from 1908. And while the label states that they're 100% Grenache Blanc, in fact, this is a field harvest, also thought to include Grenache Gris, Macabu, Torbat, and Carignan Blanc, all selection of salt. It was aged for 12 years in Old Barrique, in the loft above the winery and topped up but once every few years before it was finally bottled in 2018. It's dry and concentrated with brulee orange, walnut, cocoa, light curry spices and grape skin. To me, this is the real deal. Terrific as an aperitif and as a an, an natural in the context of small plate tapas style dining. 
It's a perfect complement for dried fruits, for mountain cheeses, and is really killer with all manner of pork, charcuterie, grilled chops, even barbecue. I once tried to talk my colleagues into hosting a pig roast with only beer and Rancio Sec. But obviously that didn't get much traction. I'm still hopeful though. I also like to wind down with a glass at the end of the evening, particularly at this time of year, sitting out in front of a fire with the sweet smell of autumn all around me, the way you might with a good bourbon or single malt scotch. For those of you interested in the technical stuff, this, the ABV on this is a natural 17%, and it has just three grams per, uh, per liter residual sugar. Now, after all that, you'd think I'd get a break, but or at least some Ranciosec. But nope, now we're on to Banyols. More specifically, we're on to the Banyols of Domaine de Mas Blanc. This, this is their La Coloque bottling. And as I detailed, Banyols and the other great Vindeau naturels of Roussillon are in some sense the sons and daughters of the wine that we know as Rancio Steg. Banyols itself is often regarded as the finest and most complex of the, uh, of the Vindeau naturels, a dark, elegant wine born of sea, sun, and stone. It also comes from one of what I regard as one of the most spectacular and un rated of all, of all terroirs in France. Its vineyards looking down over the sea with windswept patchwork terraces rising above the water and set hard to the Spanish border, just a couple kilom kilometers away the, uh, from the village of Banyol sur mer This is true Catalan country, simultaneously rugged and elegant, rustic and refined. As I mentioned, Banyols is, was part of, the, part of the first class of French AOC wines with Rivesol to Maury in 36 and is coextensive with Couillure, the appellation for dry white, rosé, and red table whites. This is a tiny appellation with limited production, marked by its black schist, like Priorat further south, and it's dominated by old vine Grenache Noir, where the yields, especially for Bagnols, are exceedingly low, typically in the range of 18 to 24 hectoliters per hectare. Banyols is made much in the way of Rancio Sec, but for the moutage or fortification that arrests the fermentation, leaving a degree of residual sugar in the finished wine. There are basically two types of Banyols. Ramage, which goes into bottle early in the first year or two following the vintage. And then there's Banyols Traditionnel, which is aged oxidatively for at least five years and often many more before bottling. This is the meaning of the phrase or, or dodge, which you occasionally see on the label when it, does not, when it doesn't carry a vintage. Traditional is the original style, like Rancio Sec, and can be made with or without temperature control, and aged in old barrique, demi mood foudres, and occasionally glass demi jeans, evolving for years and sometimes decades. While Rancio Sec is occasionally likened to sherry, Banyols is more often compared to port. If the comparison holds true, Ramage is then similar in style to vintage or ruby port, while the traditional expressions can be likened to tawny. But I like to say that Bagnols and Maury are to port what Burgundy is to Bordeaux. Bagnols is a small domain-driven appellation of families, while port is dominated by the big houses. It's a very specific singular terroir, while port's drawn from a 150-mile swath along the Duero. Banyols is also lighter. It's ABV typically 15.5 to 17.5 compared to ports 19 to 21%. And perhaps the least known, but as important as any difference, is in the fortification. With Banyols, you fortify with a 96% neutral uh, grape spirit, whereas with port, that neutral grape spirit is 77%. The practical difference is that you fortify, you have to use more in fortifying port. In fact, one fifth or 20% of every barrel of port, every bottle of port is that neutral spirit. Whereas in Banyols, it's a maximum of 10%. Taste the wine, and I think you'll agree, Banyols is in some sense more vinous, more wine with greater grace and nuance. Its proximity to the sea serving to temper its native power and lending a savory smoky maritime character and subtle saltiness uh, to the wine's expression.
Our producer, Domaine de Moss Blanc, is synonymous with the name Dr. Parse and the Parse family, which is to say synonymous with Banyols itself. Their winemaking roots stretching back through into the mid 17th century. Dr. Gaston Perse was the first to estate bottle in all of Roussillon back in 1921. And his son, Dr. Andre Perse, almost single handedly was responsible for the founding of the dry wine appellation Couleur uh, 50 years later, paving the way for Seurat and Morveder to take their place along Old Vine Grenache throughout Roussillon. He was first thought to have planted uh, the, these vines as well as Cumois, Arsan, and Roussan in the late 50s, with cuttings supplied from his good friends at Domaine Chave, Chateau de Beaucastel, and Domaine Tempier. In short, this is the great historic wine of the region, uh, the, excuse me, the great historic estate of the region, and Mas Blanc uh, has always stood for both tradition and its evolution. Jean Michel Parse took the reins from his father in 1976. And the colloque uh, that's in your glass is his bagnoles, made with old vine grenache, hand harvested from yields, about 20, per, 20 hectoliters per hectare, and then fermented with native yeast and aged in old demi moon. It's a blend of three vintages. In this instance, the vintage is 2012 through 2014, with reserve wines from prior vintages forming roughly a one third of the total blend. This was bottled in late 2019, and I find it poised and energetic. Uh, the specific vintage is lending vibrancy and exuberance and the reserve vines further depth and complexity. It can be enjoyed uh, with blue, mild blue vein cows and sheep's milk cheeses, with pâtés and with anything off the grill, but especially with lamb the way Jean-Michel does it. It's a subtle, it's a, excuse me, it's a terrific introduction to, to the wines of Bagnols and Mas Blanc. The Totem Selections also carries a number of their other wines, including their Banyol Sistrera, uh, which comes from the only true Solera and Banyols, inaugurated in 1925, as well as rare vintage bottlings dating back to 1945. Needless to say, uh, the latter are extremely limited quantities. Unlike Rancio Sec, this also, uh, cl cl well, I should say, like the Rancio Sec, this also clocks in about 17% ABV, but with about 89 grams per liter residual sugar. The open shelf life on Bagnols varies uh, according to the style and the elevage of the producer, but these typically show well for up to three to four months, and in some expressions, depending again on that elevage, even longer. As always, we recommend keeping these wines corked and refrigerated uh, or in the cellar once opened. And with that, I'm going to hand you off to my friend, Jake Parrott, who will explain to you the wonders of Madeira. Thanks, Jay. And now we turn to what may be the most well-known category within the Sotol and Selections book, and that's Madeira, particularly the wines of Henriquez and Henriquez, or H and H. Here's a picture of the island of Madeira. It's basically a rock in the middle of the Atlantic. It's sort of the last place you might think wine comes from, much better suited to bananas or sugarcane than it is to growing grapes. But the wines go all over the map. They range from bone dry to nicely sweet, from young wines, mainly best for cooking or mixing into cocktails, to some of the most ageless, timeless wines in the world. These four bottlings, the so-called Heavenly Quartet from H&H, &H, represent wines that date back from 1790 to 1825, some of the oldest wines available anywhere in the trade. We have them in stock in the USA and ready to order. H&H &H was founded in 1850, though the Henriquez family grew, has grown grapes on the island since 1425. The current winemaker, Humberto Jardim, represents the latest in a continuous string of winemaking apprenticeship from him all the way back to the first winemaker. But before we get into the real details of Madeira, I think it's important to get two concepts clear right away. First, Madeira is not a commodity category. You know, there are 200 producers on the island a long time ago. Now there are only eight. Uh, and H&H &H really stands out in some very critical ways that you can think about while you're tasting these wines. First, H&H &H is a farmer. They farm 12, about 12 hectares of grapes, um, mainly Verdelio at a, a vineyard called Quinta Grande, which will, a wine will taste in the second Madeira. But they're also the savior of the famous grape Tarantej, the most exotic and aromatic of uh, Madeira varieties. They farm 70% of what is about two hectares on the island, 
uh, and they buy much of the rest in many of the years. And that's what allows us to offer a 20-year-old Tarantej at a relatively reasonable price. The other thing H&H &H does in the cellar that's really critical and kind of informs everything about how to taste these wines is that they don't offer very many single vintage wines. They only offer them in, with exceptional wines in particular styles that really stand out. What that means is they have a much deeper bench of wine down in barrel, ready, mature, and ready as blending stock. That allows the, the 10, 15, 20-year-old wines, which you might think of as the more uh, easy to sell wines to be really, really special and be really particular, standing out amongst the rest of, of, of Madeira producers. You can think about that in two ways. One, under European law, if you label a wine with a grape variety, it only has, has to be 85% of what's in the wine. Producers with less blending stock will use Tinta Negra, uh, red grape Madeira, which is quite abundant, to blend into those white grape wines. But Tintinegra Madeira is more raisinated and softer, and so you lose some of that cut and raciness. At H&H, &H, pure varietal expression. Also, you know, the other thing, Madeira laws, those age statements on, on labels, are allowed to be what, what Madeira calls representative, uh, essentially an average. But because H&H &H has that great deep bench, they can certify that all of their age statements, 10-year-olds, 15-year-olds, 20-year-olds, even the 50-year-old Tintinegra, are strict minimums. What that means is that the acids, Madeira aging is all about its acid, have had time to evolve. And we'll talk about how you can taste for that. The other is Madeira is not port. Uh, they're completely different. Madeira, the grapes are picked a little underripe, so they age off their acid. Port, the grapes are picked a bit later and they age off their tannin and extract. Madeira, drier wines are a much bigger part of the story of Madeira than they are for port. Madeira is fortified with a much higher strength spirit. So the wine is much less diluted. It's only about 10% spirit, uh, neutral spirit, whereas port can be up to about 20% spirit. But, and last, Madeira undergoes a, a direct and deliberate oxidation process with the, the addition of heat uh, right after fortification. It takes a long time in some cases, but whereas port is always sort of kept a bit cool. The result is a bottle of Madeira, when you open it, is shelf stable. A bottle of port, even an older tawny, isn't. A tawny can last a few weeks after opening, a vintage port only a day or two. So before we get into the, uh, the details of the story of Madeira, I think I'd, it's a great time to pour yourself a bit of the Cercial 10-year-old, because I think the story will help inform how you taste the wine. So go ahead and have a, have a pour. This map shows uh, at the right the uh, west coast of Europe, and at the left the east coast of the Americas. And the red arrow points to the location of the island of Madeira. Like I said earlier, it's not really, it doesn't really look like where wine comes from. But the Portuguese brought vines there in 1419 when they settled the island. And they found quite quickly that the terrain and the environment were not particularly suited to grape growing. Because they needed to make a crop, they started to pick the grapes a bit underripe. So from day one, Madeira wine was all about its acid. That said, they had a, you know, by the 1500s, they had a, a business. Uh, Madeira was the last supply point for ships sailing south from uh, the UK or France or Spain or Portugal to get to the New World on the trade winds, the same winds that produce hurricanes today. The sailors didn't care that the wine was rod gut all the way back then. They just liked it and this was the last chance to get any before they got over. But then legend has it that some barrels came back after a hot ocean voyage. The Madeirans cracked them open and they realized the wine had gotten much better. And they weren't dumb. They started taking the, the barreled wine and putting it in the attic, letting the sun do the work and increasing the value and trade of those wines. Later on, and then around about 1750, as Madeira had a lot more competition, some folks on the island started to add a bit of the local sugarcane spirit to the, to the wines in barrel. What they found was it meant that they could keep the wine in barrel for a much longer time, let the wine evaporate and concentrate, and those acids get much more harmonious and refreshing. That's how Madeira became a fine wine but its path to market was still the same, ships selling west to the new world. So that's the story whose punchline is the Declaration of Independence, and most likely dinner afterwards, was toasted with Madeira. 75% of wine drunk in the colonies was Madeira wine. And so it's really important to remember that Madeira foodways and early American foodways are intertwined. And some of those pairings are timeless and beautiful, especially if you get the right wines made the right way. So how do you make them? 
Madeira is fortified to stop fermentation and set a sugar level rather than down in barrel later. Uh, wines meant to be uh, bottled young are heated in uh, tanks. You see there on the left, a, a, looks like a jacketed brew kettle like you might find at a beer brewery, but it, they run the water around it at about 120 degrees for several months and that creates that, that heating and that oxidation and then the wines go down in cask for a few years. The more traditional way is, is pictured at the right, the so-called Cantero system. The Cantero, Cantero is the name for the barrel rick, like you might see in a rick house. H&H &H uses this system for all of their white grape wines. Not every producer does that. So what they do is they, they'll fortify the wine, get it down in old 620 liter American oak barrels, get it up in the attic. It takes eight, nine, 10 years for it really to finish its oxidation and it's, and it's the beginning of its evolution. And at that point, it enters H&H's blending stock. Of course, we've talked already about how deep that is. We've talked about white grape and red grape Madeira. I think a, a quick look at those grapes is important. Uh, the main red grape on the island is Tinta Negra. It, for, it makes about 85% of all the wine made on the island. And it can, it's allowed to be made at any sweetness level, which makes it useful as blending stock in, in white grape wines for producers that do that. But it also makes for nice wines that you can drink early, like a, a Rainwater or H&H &H does a couple of beautiful five-year-olds. The white grapes are much more heavily regulated. We talked already about Tarantege, super, super rare. All of, none of them are, are all that abundant on the island. From Cercial the driest to Malvasia the sweetest, though, they have to be made at a specific sweetness level. So now I think it's time to see what all this means with the Cercial 10 year old in your glass. So, uh, Cercial, the grape, sometimes called Ejgana Cow or the dog strangler in Portuguese because it's so acidic and bitter, is required to be made the driest of, of all the things, of all the wines on the island. And sometimes, you know, it can be very, very harsh, especially if there's a lot of young wine in the blend. But if you think about, uh, you can taste for these two concepts we've been talking about, the no Tinta Negra and the, uh, and the extra age, the minimum age statement. No Tinta Negra, you don't really feel any raisin character in this wine, which is what you would get from blending in Tinta Negra. It's all cut and racy acidity. And maturity, well, if you think about what an underripe grape wine tastes like, like a young uh, basic vino verde, all of the acid really concentrates on the tip of the tongue. And that's the case with young Madeira as well. The longer it matures, the more those acids wash across the entire tongue. And that's what you get here. You get much more of the acid going toward the middle and back of the tongue. That's how you taste for maturity. If you get that prickly acid on the tip of your tongue, you know there's young wine in the blend. But that fulsome acidity all the way across the tongue means that this wine is an excellent pairing for all kinds of fish and seafood. We love to drink it with oysters. That's the traditional American pairing for Cercial, uh, but it works with steamed clams, grilled fish, sauteed fish, pretty much anything. So it's very, very useful at table, uh, even with some strongly flavored fish. The Cercial 10-year-old represents H&H's great skill as a blender and their approach, but we also need to talk about their legacy as a farmer. To do that, we have another wine and we have Jay Hennehan. Thanks, Jake. While Madeira may be the best known category of aged oxidative wine we represent, the Verdelo Single Harvest QG 2007 is unique, and one of the most exciting in our portfolio. Madeira is undoubtedly a fine wine, amongst one of the greatest in my, in my opinion. But many of the practices uh, defy fine wine conventions, and the, its vineyards are one of them. As Jake said, H&H &H is the only producer on the island to own vineyards, including the 10 hectare Quinta Gran, which is pictured here. Most vineyards are owned by Madeira mom and pops, by neighbors, or the guy that fixes your car, and the average size of a Madeira vineyard is just a half an acre. So we had long thought that H&H &H should really highlight their vineyard ownership, the fact that they are the only grower on the island. But each time we brought this idea to Umberto, He'd look at us and smile, indulging us while making a plain he thought we were being ridiculous. That is, until one day, in late 2018, he handed us an unmarked bottle. He poured the wine and tasted it and said, Verdelo, really, really good Verdelo. It took a moment before it dawned on us. Verdelo from Quinta Grande. He paused, again, making it plain he still thinks that we're ridiculous, before he said, yes, of course. And so this is it, the wine that we've been asking for, dreaming of, the only single vineyard wine made or even possible 
on the island of Madeira. The wine that proves that despite being a wine of process, Madeira can also have the stamp of terroir and a vineyard signature. As I taste this wine, I find all the classic Madeira, excuse me, Verdelo notes and flavors. The apricot kernel, mandarin orange and dried honeycomb, roasted nuts and island spices, sea salt and sea smoke. But I also get something else I've never experienced in a Verdelo, even from H&H, &H, eucalyptus. And the Quintigran vineyard is lined with eucalyptus. So to experience the vineyard in the taste of the wine, especially in a Madeira, it's positively thrilling, at least for Madeira geeks like us. Just to fill in a few blanks before I introduce you to Lauren Clark, single harvest or colieta means that the wine has been aged in Cantairo for at least five years. This wine spent 12 before bottling. As with their vintages, H&H &H only bottles single harvest wines of singular expression in need of a solo, as it were. Otherwise, those wines would remain at the service of age statements. While the Sociale you tasted with Jake was secco or dry, Verdelo is always mayo secco or medium dry. And for that reason, it's perhaps the most versatile and adaptable of the classic varieties of the table. This wine makes a lovely companion to seafood uh, and fish stews, to roast chicken, to all manner of cheeses, but especially mountain cheeses, and of course, nuts. Pro tip, however, bring this wine to Thanksgiving dinner, and you will astound your family and friends with how well this goes with absolutely everything. As with all Madeiras, this one is entirely shelf stable. We could cork the bottle and come back next year and we still all be enjoying the same wine. But beyond the utility and stability, beyond even the rarity, the single vineyard, the fact that this is a single vineyard Madeira, it's really what's in the glass that makes the case for the wine. And now I'll give you to Lauren for a tour of our website. Thanks, Jay. Hello, I'm Lauren Clark, the National Marketing Manager for Sotalon Selections and Household Pens. I'm going to give you a brief tour of the Sotalon Selections portfolio at alpins.com. And before I do that, I'm going to disappear my video so that I don't get in the way of anything on your screen. Starting from the home page, go to our wines menu and just scroll down to Sotalon Selections and you'll get just a long page of everything in that portfolio, as you can see. Now going back up to the top, if you, can, uh, you can search for wines by category. So I'm gonna go ahead and just click Roncio Sec. And here you have everything, uh, all of the Roncio wines that we carry in this category. Now I'm gonna click on one particular product, Domaine de Rombo, Roncio Sec 2010 so that you can see our detailed, uh, our detailed product page for this, for this wine. And you'll find pretty much everything you need to know about the, uh, the wine and uh, tasting notes and the producer, a um, little, uh, little thumbnail map, um, some pairing suggestions, uh, some serving and storage suggestions, um, and the setup info at the very bottom. And these pages can easily be printed out as one page fact sheets. Uh, and if you just hit Control P and save as a PDF rather than, than printing it out, uh, or go ahead and print it out <laughs> if you'd like. Uh, and all this information uh, fits on one page. You can also search for wines uh, by producer um, or origin. Uh, and searching by origin is a good way to get to know our interactive maps. If you just uh, start from, uh, from a high-level view of France, uh, you can see various uh, regions that uh, uh, are reflected in, in our portfolio. And if you mouse over them, you can see them demarcated. And now I'm just going to click on Roussillon so that you can see a zoomed-in map of Roussillon. Uh, and then again, I can click on uh, one of the AOPs. I'll go ahead and click on Bagnol and you are drilled down even further into the Bonniel's AOP uh, and the producer uh, uh, whose wines we carry from that region, Domaine du Mas Blanc. Finally, uh, if 
if you're looking for setup information um, all in one place, uh, go to the resources menu and click setup. And you have all that information now in one long scrolly list. Uh, and do not forget to go left to right as well because there's additional information horizontally. Uh, also under the resources menu um, is information about storage and handling of our wines, aromatized wines, as well as sparkling and oxidative wines. Finally, uh, since the Sotolong portfolio has a wealth of vintages, uh, you can find them here. And you can search um, roughly uh, per decade for what you're looking for. Um, and this part of the website will be uh, updated with additional information fairly soon. So come back and check it out because there will be more to read here. And with that, I'm going to hand you back to Eric Seed, who's going to tell you a little bit about some of our Sotolong wines. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Lauren. This one's exciting. Uh, Carcavelos, it's called. This is a uh, category that's all but disappeared. Uh, it's certainly a wine that's not been seen stateside in at least half a century. And the only way it's, it's been known is as a test question for budding, or trick question for that matter, for budding some ways. So, what is it? Um, Carcavelos is the smallest ap appellation in all of Portugal, with just 25 hectares under vine, one of the smallest in all of Europe. It is located in a region just west of Lisbon, just beyond the Tagus Estuary, uh, right, right on the Atlantic Ocean. And it's been recognized as one of the four great Vino Generoso of Portugal, after Madeira, Port and Moscatel de Setubal. That's the uh, test question. <laughs> so Carcavelos, uh, it was essentially created by one of the giants of Portuguese history, the guy you see there on the left, the Marquis de Pombal, served as the prime minister from 1750 to 1777. He created the region of Port, and in doing so was no longer uh, able to ship his grapes into the Douro. And so he began to promote his own wine, Carcavelos, named for a nearby town. So given his uh, political question, <laughs> connections, and the quality of his wines, uh, Carcavelos quickly rose uh, to prominence. He was sent to the imperial court in Peking, as it was called then, back in 1759, and was part of the first ever wine auction hosted by Christie's uh, 10 years later, along with Burgundy, Hock, and Malaga. So, like port, and especially Madeira, it was shipped to England, to Brazil, and to the United States. Uh, Thomas Jefferson, America's foremost uh, wine connoisseur, or at least consumer of the age, was quite a fan of the Wireless wine. That said, it never quite developed the uh, prominence of those other regions, largely in part to its small size, but also you had the success of plagues and Odium, phylloxera, or, and then uh, that land itself uh, was highly desirable property right on the ocean and being so close to Lisbon. But over successive years, parcel after parcel became uh, very nice homes. By the last decades of the 20th century, uh, this wine was really on the brink of extinction, and there were less than 12 hectares uh, under vine, and only two active producers remaining. This is where the Portuguese Ministry of Agriculture, as well as the city of Aurelius, uh, stepped in, it's, uh, seeking to protect the remaining uh, vineyards. In 1983, they established Villa Aurelius on the very same uh, palace grounds of the Marquis de Pombal. You see in the picture his original wine estate. They store barrels there today for this wine you're tasting. Uh, today, it is the only publicly owned winery in Portugal. And today, it's also the last remaining producer of this wine. So, uh, the winery is located, as I mentioned, on uh, the palace grounds. There's a second facility that you see in the upper left-hand corner. Uh, this is called Casal de Mantega. This is where they do the vinification and also a portion of the, uh, the aging. Um, the estate of Villaluiris is right around 12 and a half hectares. It's nearly half the entire DOC as it is today. 
they've planted on uh, calcareous uh, soils just 200 meters from that Tagus estuary. The vines they use are actually derived from the original plum ball cuttings. You can believe it. Uh, material that traces its roots back more than three centuries. While the region uh, permits nine different varieties, both white and red, uh, the primary grape varieties are, that are used and what you're tasting are white wine grapes. Arinto, Gallego Dorado, and Ratinho, roughly in equal parts. These grapes are hand harvested when they're fermented separately in stainless steel. The fermentation is arrested with a 77% brandy. It's actually from the nearby region of La Riña. Delicious stuff if it's tasted. These are then blended together and aged in two types of wood. Uh, oak from Portugal, as they call it, Nacional, as well as uh, French oak cask. So the uh, Parcavelos 15-year wine that you're tasting, uh, it's considered the benchmark of the Appalachian. Um, I think you'll pick up some of the richness that you might be familiar with with Paul Madeira. But there are these other characteristics that come from the Rinto. There's this uh, ocean, oceanic character, and also this uh, honey cake element that is a signature to this style of wine. If you enjoy it, we do have another expression from the Low Eras. We do have some rare vintages from a, uh, an, a long extinct uh, vineyard. Anyway. Enjoy. If you have questions, I'll Q and A after. Uh, on to Jay. Thanks again, Eric. After our sojourn in Portugal with Madeira and Carcavelos, we'll return home to Roussillon and the final wine of our tasting, Chateau de Zao Rivasalt Rancio 2000. Along with Bagnols and Maury, Rivasalt is one of the three great French Vindo naturels or fortified wines. It's the largest appellation in the region, with a production zone that only omits the vineyards that produce banyols along the far southeastern coast. As such, Rivasol can be made from a variety of different terroirs, with dark schist, granite, and limestone clay soils along its northern slopes, and dry garrigue scented clay, sand, and gravel on the plains around Perpignan, where the majority of the wine is produced. Rivasol comes in every conceivable color and style, and with that range and variability in expression or perhaps in part to explain its current somewhat mixed reputation. It's fortified in the same manner as Bagnols by a moutage and, and the best free results are in the traditional style, oxidatively aged. Some of these can be some of France's most long-lived wines and a few examples from the 19th century are still occasionally to be found. For grapes, Grenache Blanc, Grenache Gris, Macabu, Muscat, and Torbat are approved for the whites, while the reds are founded primarily on Grenache Noir, with a bit of Carignan occasionally thrown in for good measure. Given the proximity of both Bagnols and Maury, uh, which are red grape only, the white versions are far more commonly uh, found as, as expressions. Chateau de Zao was founded in 1846 in the heart of the Tet Valley, just outside Tuir, which is the home of Beer Grand Quinquina. From the beginning, the Passama family has always owned vineyards, but it didn't begin bottling until Hervé Passama and his wife Beatrice returned to the estate in 18, excuse me, in 1986. It's always been best known for its Rivasol Ombre, and more recently for its Rancio Sec. Both of these come from its, the same small 1.9 hectare vineyard with 70-year-old Grenache Gris vines grown on agrocalcare soils, studded with galay stones, not unlike Chateau de Pop. The Tramontana wind shrivels the late harvest grapes um, on the vine prior to harvesting, and the wine is fermented with native yeast and left on its skins for a week. But despite the old vines, Elevage is what really set Chateau, Chateau de Sao Rancio, uh, Rivasol Rancio, and Domaine de Sao Rancio sex apart. The wines are aged in a former horse barn, Beatrice standing there in the doorway, and situated behind, that's situated behind the Sech Chateau. It's a truly magical place for oxidative aging, with temperature ranges from 55 to 80 degrees Fahrenheit, and the wind always blowing outside its wooden doors year round. 
Once inside, you'll find the Bordelais fruits are stacked uh, choose and freeze. Of course, there's no temperature control. And due to the wind, this table is quite dry, which leads to an impressive evaporation and concentration. The wines uh, we have from Chateau de Zao, vintages 1998 through 2002, were set aside for further aging and then consolidated in barrel only once every five years, but otherwise were left unattended. When finally bottled in 2019, these were unusually concentrated, a 2000 year glass, no exception, with a pronounced Rancio character that's rarely seen in modern day expression. Hence, the, our decision to bottle this is Revisal Rancio as opposed to Revisal Tombre. Here, Rancio is a descriptor rather than the name of the category. But at this juncture, if you don't know what Rancio is after tasting this, I'm not sure we can help you. With Hervé's passing and Beatrice's retirement last year, this is the last testament of one of the great terroirs of oxidative aging in all of Roussillon. This 20-year-old wine has a heady, lifted nose that reminds me a bit of rum apricot, and it's got this lavish texture that is a hallmark of its elevage and of the estate, with caramelized citrus fruits and rancio spice perfectly matched to the old vine Grenache Gris fruit. It clocks in at 20% ABV and boasts 168 grams per liter residual sugar. Given its elevage, I'd wager that this wine is probably indestructible and can be joy enjoyed for many months, if not years to come, even after opening. It's dessert wine, it's a dessert in a glass, but it can also be enjoyed with blue uh, main cows and sheep's milk cheeses, with dried fruits and any vanilla based dessert. If I'm to sum this wine up, I'm reminded of a line from a, a movie, Spinal Tap. This one goes to 11. And with that, I'll hand you over, back over to NC Jake for a bit of Q&A. Please stay with us. Thank you, Jay, and good afternoon. Um, that was quite a, quite a lineup of wines uh, we've uh, got there. And uh, we're, we've got an opportunity for some live Q&A. Eric Seed, the founder and, uh, and principal, is on. Jay is on. A few of the rest of our team are on. Uh, and we have a couple of special guests as well uh, to, uh, to kind of kick off the conversation. We have one to kick off the conversation. I'd like to introduce my dear friend, Sarah Aducci from Belmont Butchery in Richmond, Virginia. Um, Sarah and I have presented on pairing cheese and, and funny fortified wines of various ilks in the past. And so I, I knew that she was going to be around her cheeses today. And so I wanted to, to give a chance for her to to, uh, to chat in a little more specificity about pairing cheese with some of these wines. And I think since we, we all uh, uh, just had the, uh, the 2000 uh, Chateau de Sal Rives Alt Rancio, let's start with that. Sarah, what do you think? Oh, I think these wines, first of all, are fantastic. This has been a great assortment of things to taste with cheese. Um, I sort of, uh, because I happen to have a ton of cheese right now, I made myself a little plate with nine cheeses to try some of these with. Um, and this last wine, um, I, I found really like overall super flexible with cheese. It's just was not a train wreck with any of the cheeses that I have going here today. I had some little Caramont Fresh Chev here, some Cremant from um, Vermont Creamery, a little double cream cow goat. Uh, some Taleggio here, a little washed rind in the mix, some sheep's milk from Italy. Um, what else did I try it with? Schnabelhorn, Rongbach, which is a uh, Swedish cheese, sort of like a hybrid between um, a, um, Alpine style and a cheddar. And then I have some Parm and Gouda and then a really strong blue. And I would normally have thought that this would have gone better with some of the more aged cheeses that have a little more caramel, a little more nuttiness. But I really, really loved it with the younger cheeses. Um, Cremant and this cheese. Uh, Cremant is a double cream cow and goat blend from Vermont, which is pretty much you can almost find everywhere, was fantastic with it. And then also the Vildavida, which is like an aged Gouda because it has this really fruity quality. I also really liked with it. It's a little raw cow's milk from a island in the south of Holland. Oh. Thanks, Sarah. I think, I think part of the fun there is, is for a wine that has so much intensity and, and sugar, the, the acidity in this wine is really, really cool. 
And, uh, and that's something we find when we pair H&H Madeiras with cheese as well. Uh, with you know, a boile from H&H, which is still pretty crunchy, works awfully well with very soft cheeses, uh, much the same way I think we may have had here. Um, yeah, this was super fun to be able to try all these different mm -hmm. styles of cheese with these, all of these wines. It's not very often that I have a whole lineup in front of me to explore with. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> The, the other wine that I, th I think to look at is, is the first wine, the, the Fontenelle uh, Rancio Seclo Sech, um, a wine uh, you and I were texting uh, during the thing you, you were really taken by. And what, what do you think about from a cheese perspective for this guy? Um, this one, I, I really love this, this wine. And um, for this one, I sort of go to one of those traditional ways of pairing wines and cheeses, which is like with like, sort of, you have this sort of lighter, brighter uh, wine. And I really, really enjoyed it with fresh goat cheese, which is sort of citrusy and alive and just really light and easy. Um, it was also really good with um, the Telegio, which was kind of amazing to me, and the rind on the Telegio added this really nice nuttiness with this, with this wine, which was kind of fun. Um, pretty much across the board, it wasn't, it was pretty nice with most of the things. The sheep's milk was really good with it too. Um, some of the heavier cheeses tended to overwhelm it. I think it just showcased more, friend, was more friendly with some of the, um, the younger, easier, lighter, fresher cheeses for sure. Yeah, but I, I think this one might be my favorite. I don't know. That's hard to say. <laughs> and, and, you know, apropos of the, the, the more intense or the heavier cheeses, uh, sometimes sugar really is your friend when it comes to pairing. Um, of course, you know, we might also say that uh, sometimes botanicals are your friend in pairing with cheeses like that. You know, those two wines are both from, from Catalonia, from the French part of Catalonia, but Catalonia nonetheless. And I, I think Catalan cheeses don't get a lot of play here in the States. They're not a ton available regularly in the U.S., but, um, but do you want to talk a little bit about those before we let you go? Yeah, I mean, there's a handful of things you can get your hands on from time to time. A lot of them are special orders. They don't, you know, you really have to get a full order together before people bring them in. Um, Garocha is one of the most probably easily found that you might have out there in your cheese case. Um, it's a beautiful little two pound wheel. It's got this gorgeous little gray, slightly fuzzy bloom on the top, which apparently in Catalan is Pel Florida, which means bloomy rind. Um, um, it's a younger cheese. It's maybe aged about 60 to 75 days in the most instances, although it can age out and be pretty tasty too. Um, almost went extinct in the 80s, but thankfully was revived and now has several producers that are making this gorgeous sort of flaky, but still smooth paste, delicious little twang of goat. Um, another one that I've had in the cow's milk variety is Orhelia, which I haven't seen in a while, but that one's sort of tender and easy, has a little slightly washed rind. Um, and that one, one is one of the DOP cheeses. Um, another one that's a old time favorite of mine is, um, Campujo Nevat, which is a gorgeous, like dense pillow of goat's milk that just is stunning. Just this fluffy, it's like a cheese marshmallow, like a firmer cheese marshmallow. <laughs> But goat's milk twang, absolutely delightful. Um, one of the other ones that I haven't seen in a while, which was, a more, again, a goat's milk cheese, um, the Soto de Cabra is this beautiful little small nugget. It looks like a rock almost. The rind is this sort of dark brown natural rind. And again, that beautiful twang with the nuts and herbal qualities in, in the goat's milk from that area. Um, and then one that was a dream that I absolutely adored was uh, Tour de Teler. And I have not seen this one in several years. This was a bloomy rind style cheese, raw milk brie style, which was amazing. Tremendously complex. You had your cream, you had your mushrooms. It was just this sort of slightly barnyardy, but in the best possible way, um, brie style. That was awesome. I mean, awesome. I wish I could get all of these all the time. Yeah, and something to think about if, uh, as and when we're able to travel again. But those of you who are out there who sell cheese as well as wine, please agitate for more Catalan cheeses. Um, Sarah, thank you so much. I really yeah, appreciate you taking you. a little time today. Oh, this was wonderful. Thanks, everybody. Cheers. <laughs> All right, we've got some great more general questions here uh, as well. And the next one comes from Megan Allred uh, from Pennsylvania. Thanks for writing in, Megan. Uh, she writes, these products are all fairly new to me. Aside from the website, this tasting and y'all's knowledge, is there a book or books you might recommend that covers these wines? And uh, I think I'll throw that one to Jay first. 
Uh, thanks, Jake. So, Megan, uh, to answer your question, uh, there are some books. Uh, however, a uh, few might be hard to come by, uh, as you might imagine, particularly Ron Siosek. Not a lot been written uh, on Ron Siosek. In fact, nothing book-wise in the English language. Uh, several years ago, there was a, a book uh, published in France called Laurent Siosek's De Roussillon. I'll hold that up here. I'm not sure how well you can see it. Um, this is a terrific compendium uh, from the source. Uh, Eric is actually featured uh, with a page and a half on, on the uh, importer's perspective, but it uh, gives general coverage to the history of the category, uh, the differences between the Cote Catalan and uh, Cote Vermeil IGP expressions, and uh, delves into the producers as well. Uh, Perhaps a bit easier uh, than that, um, uh, a uh, article was published uh, just earlier this year, I think the January, February edition of Wine and Spirits magazine. Uh, their executive editor, Tara Thomas, uh, fell in love with Rancio and uh, reached out to us. Uh, and uh, so we had a wonderful opportunity to sit down and uh, walk through all of the Rancio sex in the portfolio with her uh, late last November. Uh, so that, that would be highly recommended as well. We can put a link to that uh, perhaps uh, in the chat. Maybe Lauren will do that while we're speaking. Uh, with regard to uh, Banyols and the other, uh, Rivasalt and the other Vindo Naturels of uh, Roussillon, uh, not a lot has been written recently. Um, probably the best general introduction is an old book by Rosemary George called uh, the wines of the south of France, Bagnols de Saint Raphael. While it's not totally up to date on the producers, it's wonderful as a part opposed to giving you the setting and the history of the wines. And then uh, on Madeira, uh, there's a number of books. I find that the two best go to's in the English language uh, the second edition book by Alex Little called Madeira, uh, the Mid Atlantic wine. Let me see if I. We have that here. Yeah. Um, Alex Little is an English writer, uh, very academic and scholarly, but uh, also highly practical. And then another English writer, Richard Mason, uh, who is uh, connected with the Blandys family. He married in, uh, but his book, Madeira, The Islands and Their Wines, is also quite, quite a good reference point. Uh, finally, Carcavelo, not unlike uh, uh, Rancio Sec, has not been given wide play uh, in the English language, but uh, um, our website is probably the best source um, uh, for that. There's uh, been a book published not too long back in, in Portuguese, but uh, probably uh, fewer of you read Portuguese than read French. Uh, but uh, in the future, we'll be doing smaller, gauged, uh, more focused articles that you can find on the website. Thanks, Jake. Uh, Eric, do you have anything you want to add? Uh, I don't think so. Cool. There's a lot of reading already. <laughs> There's a lot of reading. Um, all right. Uh, our next question, we have another special guest. Lee would like to introduce. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Jake. Uh, I want to introduce Bobby Burgess. She is the sommelier at uh, restaurant Tyler in Starkville, Mississippi. So one of those wonderful sommeliers from very small markets around the country uh, who is doing their part to uh, broaden horizons. Uh, so I'm gonna unmute her now and uh, Bobby can ask her question. Yeah, thank you. Um... So I'm in a very small market and oftentimes I find that, um, especially with older guests who have been experienced to lower quality products when they, you know, buy them in the stores, um, products that are usually used for cooking more than they are for actual drinking, that they won't try other sherries or Madeira or Marsala's because they've just been burned um in the past i can give them like the other night i um, couldn't get them to drink sherry but i got them to order a 1988 um carcaveo on saturday night but they would not try sherry at all what are ways that you can 
for us to help guests lower their walls when they just haven't been experienced to good quality um, products in the past. Jay, you've, you've been a, a floor sommelier for, for years. What, uh, you want to talk about that first? Well, it sounds like Barbara uh, already knows something of what to do since she uh, was able to turn them from Sherry to Carcavelos. Obviously, uh, as I think it's clear, these wines are not a natural go-to um, where perhaps they once were. And uh, a lot of what we do is uh, sort of guerrilla warfare, hand-to-hand -hand combat with regard to talking and tasting these wines, whether it's in front of you in person or to some degree, you know, vis-a-vis -vis, uh, these sorts of mediums that we're all uh, forced to uh, under the age of COVID. Um, tasting is, is, is the best, uh, getting people to taste is the best approach, but also framing the wines, uh, particularly if you're a retailer, framing them in the context of groups and, and presenting them as something that people can, you know, move to from other things that they already know. Um, you know, more and more we're seeing a convergence of the wine world with the uh, uh, spirits and cocktails world. So we find resonance between the flavors of some of the brown spirits, uh, uh, bourbon, uh, single malt scotch, etc., with a, a lot of what we do in the Sotalon uh, portfolio. So those sorts of moves and, and, and the like, I think are, are the way, but you know, if we had the answer, uh, these wines would be more popular than they are, of course. We also had this, this question, a similar question come in from Thad Parsons on the retail side. Um, Eric or Jay, if you have anything else you wanna think about on the retail side, Thad wrote that um, you know, uh, with a lot of sales moving online, it's, a, it's harder to, to have the casual conversations. Uh, I will add that between our website and, um, and some other writings, we have a lot of, uh, we have a lot of uh, assets available to you, uh, and we're also happy to come in and talk virtually to your customers. But uh, Eric? Yeah, I think, you know, uh, picking up on, uh, on Jay's point, uh, making these referential to what the customer may know, that uh, many of the sweet wines that people may have tasted in the past are uh, maybe, maybe very primary, like ruby port, or uh, like many dessert wines, just very heavy on the sweet uh, without much of an expression of age. Whereas in the case of so many of these, you really are getting a great taste of age that uh, the customer may be familiar with from other mediums, such as with, uh, with dark age spirits. So I'll leave it at that. Bobby, you have any uh, anything else you wanted you wanted to chat about? That was the only um, question I had. Um, was that, and then I potentially have this crazy idea in my head about doing a Corcovados dinner with like multiple vintages. Um, since I sold four bottles on Saturday night, insanely of the nineteen eighty eight. Um, but I'm trying to frame if I think that's something I could get enough people interested in Starkville, Mississippi to do. Jay? I'll be there. <laughs> um, um, Jake, I mean, I think you have the most experience of, of pairing these wines with food. Um, you know, I don't know that I would approach this as a dinner per se, but more of a round table, uh, depending on the ability to do that again in these times, but a, a round table where you're tasting and talking about the wines and it's free flowing with uh, a selection kind of small plate style that people uh, can taste while they're exploring the wines together would be the, the way that I would likely approach it. Yeah, th this is another this is another category of wine where acidity is is so much fun, and it's what makes the a lot of the the Carcavelish wines actually do quite nicely with savory food. That said, um, you know some people might not expect to to go to a dinner and drink all wines with with these levels of residual sugar, uh, but you could start with a, a relatively fresh goat or sheep's milk cheese type dish. You could have some foie gras or another sort of pate 
dream type thing. You can have a little bit of, of duck with maybe a, a citric sauce or a sweeter sauce. And then of course, a, a, a bigger, a heavier cheese, a more intense cheese and some dessert and, and, and do it, you know, you could do it as small plates, you could do it as a walk around. I mean, I've even seen people do virtual wine dinners where they actually box up the snacks and the pours of the wines and people pick them up. So it's, um, but I, I, I think that as long as you don't, you know, sometimes the thing with wine dinners is you end up with a, a very large main course that, you know, kind of, you know, disrupts the rhythm of the wines. And I think um, with these wines, it's, it's an opportunity to do something that's a little more kind of measured out. Uh, but you can definitely find things all the way through a meal format to, to pair with different vintages and different wines from Carcavelos. Awesome. Well, thanks a lot, Bobby. Um, let's see, we got a couple, couple more questions here. We got a nice technical question here. Uh, Nicolene Iacono from, uh, from Brunswick, Maine, uh, wonderful shop in Brunswick, Maine, Vessel and Vine, uh, asks about development in bottle. Um, talking about, in, asking in particular about Madeira, she's got a, an older bottle of, of Boal, a, a Garifera bottling of Boal, asking about development in bottle. Um, Jay, do you want to talk about maybe development in bottle for, for Madeira and for Banyols Tradicional? You're muted, Jay. So sure, I'd be, I'd be happy to. The, the short answer to the, the question is these wines aren't going to develop in bottle. So they are already fully developed. To the degree that a wine is either oxidative uh, or in Madeira's case, what we did call fully oxidized, they have arrived at, at, a terminal, at, at a terminal point with regard to their development. So once it goes into the bottle, you're not going to see any appreciable change. And uh, therefore, if you're having a hard time resisting, crack it open tonight. Um, the nice thing about it is it's also not gonna change once it, it's opened. You can, you know, two or three ounces at a time, reward yourself over the course of, you know, months or years, and you'll still be enjoying the same wine. With uh, a wine like uh, Banyol's Traditionnel, the answer with regard to when to open it is the same, uh, but once you open it, uh, while it may last for many months, it's not a quote-unquote fully oxidized wine, and so you will see a small diminution in the character of the wine after you reach a certain point. My general rule is three to four months with those wines if they're kept well in between the times that you're, you're enjoying them. Now, there is a category uh, that we do work in uh, a little bit that has very important development considerations in bottle, and that's Banyol's Rimage. Uh, Jay, do you want to talk about that a little bit? Yeah, so as I mentioned, uh, Banyol's is made in two styles. The older style is the traditional style where it's been aged for a minimum of five years uh, oxidatively before going into bottle and often much, much longer than that. Uh, we have some that spent nearly 30 years in barrel, uh, the uh, Domaine de Mas Blanc Banyols collection wines prior to going into bottle. Uh, these again will have uh, relative stability once you open them for a period of months. Banyols Ramage uh, is more akin to the way that Ruby and uh, vintage porter made, which is to say <clears throat> the wines are made and sometime between a year and two years, <clears throat> pardon me, they go into bottle and their subsequent development is in bottle. In those instances, you will get that further development over time. And you, it's up to you to decide when you, uh, you know, are going to appreciate the wine most. Some people like the power of the younger expression. Some people prefer to see the wine develop and mellow uh, over the period, of course, of years. Now, our, our Ramage are older expressions, so they are already fairly a lot, well along in their development. And as they do, the changes will get uh, less and less than it would have been in the early years. Awesome, thanks, Jay. And our last question comes from Michael Pena from the Green Zone in Washington, DC, which is a fantastic, fantastic and highly innovative bar. Um, and the question is, is do you see any trends using these wines in cocktails? And I think maybe we'll start with uh, Eric on that one. Sure. It, uh, what to say, when th something's delicious, has texture, has acidity and age, it's going to find its way into mixed drinks. And, um, 
Yeah, I know with, uh, with Roncio Sec, we have a handful of customers that use it to lend both the taste of age and Venice texture into drinks. Um, one of our leading customers, I think, would be uh, the Monte Foc, um, which is from the Banyos region, uh, Roncio Sec. Uh, mixes it with the, the Rothman and Winter Orchard Peach Liqueur to give a aged peach brandy um, experience to a, uh, uh, to a spritz drink. Um, and then, I mean, there's some uh, classic old applications. Uh, there's a rainwater with tonic, I believe. Something you'll find on the island and, uh, and in history. I don't know, other, uh, other things you, you, felt you folks have seen? Yeah, Eric, if I may, there is a cocktail in our database mm -hmm. with the Matifak and uh, Cognac uh, with Peixo. Uh, it is delightful and uh, mint. It looks like, visually, it looks like a uh, uh, Queen's Park Swizzle, uh, but it's with Rancio Sec and, uh, and French Brandy. Uh, so... Uh, delightful amount of acid that that Matifak adds to that cocktail. Mm. Yeah, I mean, we talk a lot when we talk on the House Alpen side about uh, uh, the about this idea of dilutability. Um, that that something is useful in drinks that when you, if you dilute it, it still provides great expressiveness. And there's certainly with dry rancio with no fortification and and that great evaporation and concentration, you get that. Uh, other things in the portfolio, I mean, mixing with Madeira is about 100 years older than mixing with vermouth. You think about punches and sangarees, things like that. Um, that would be the, the main other one. Um, we did just bring a relatively dry and, and nicely priced Marsala to the market, which hasn't made it everywhere yet. That is really, really awesome with gin as well. A um, couple of comments from, the, from folks writing into the chat. Um, Whitney Sactalon from, uh, from Southeastern Virginia. Uh, talks about how she started to open bottles, uh, open and taste uh, bottles of Karkavelish, uh, and now it's extremely popular. Uh, she works uh, at a, uh, she just, just worked, moved over to a butcher shop in Hampton Roads. Um, so uh, thanks, thank you for that. Uh, Nicolene, uh, who wrote in the question earlier, also says that there, there are ways to use some of these in, in place of uh, vermouth or aromatized wines to kind of create that texture in cocktails. Um, so uh, thank you for that as well. Uh, and I believe that's all we have time for. Um, Eric, any uh, last thoughts? Just to thank everyone for coming today and uh, tasting through with us. Really appreciate your time and your interest in these wines. Jay, any, uh, anything else you'd like to add? No, uh, I think Eric summed it up well. I mean, obviously we we love these wines, perhaps to the point of irrationality, and we hope the opportunity you had today to taste them has imparted a little bit of that irrationality to you. So go, go forth and fight the good fight. Awesome. And with that, it is just for me to say, good evening. <laughs>